This book is the epitome of be gay, do crime. <laughs> it's fine. I'm fine. I'm so sad now. It's good. It's it's good. This is good. It's so good. Just read it, you know? Like <laughs> Hello, hi, welcome. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Hannah. Today I'm very excited to be bringing you another reading experiment video and this one is one I've been planning for quite some time. A lot of these books are books I've been wanting to read for years and I finally got around to them. So today I'm going to be reading five dark academia books to see what I think of them. So dark academia. It's both an aesthetic and a genre that has been around for quite some time. I remember back when I was in high school dark academia was a really big thing especially on Tumblr and in the past few years with the growth of TikTok, dark academia has once again become a very popular, now more mainstream aesthetic. According to the wiki definition, dark academia is a literary and social media aesthetic and subculture concerned with higher education, writing slash poetry, the arts, and classic Greek and Gothic architecture. The subculture is associated with ancient art and classic literature. While all of that is definitely true for mainstream dark academia, especially in terms of the lifestyle or fashion interpretations of the aesthetic, as far as dark academia and literature goes, I would say that the genre typically tends to offer a critique of academia. Sometimes that can manifest as a deeper look into what college life is like, the influence and effect that that has on students and their mental well-being, and the mystique and exclusivity that is often attributed to universities. Other times it can be an even more critical look at uh, the universities themselves, academic systems, and who they truly benefit who they exploit, and the systems of oppression and systems of power that work within academia. And in my opinion, that's what some of the best dark academia books do. And that's why it's one of my favorite genres to read. So as I was reading these books, and as I read any dark academia book, I'm always looking for something that offers that kind of insight and that deeper look into this romanticized notion of academia that we have. So it's actually really fascinating how much sometimes the actual physical aesthetic can kind of juxtapose the themes that are present in the literature that we associate with dark academia. So while this side kind of romanticizes it, the literature often offers a critique of it. So yeah, I just find that really fascinating. I feel like there's just a lot to delve into there. But with all that being said, we have five books to get into and discuss, and I'm very, very excited. I do also quickly want to say, because I know I'm going to get questions about this, if you're wondering why a certain book is not on this list, even though it's technically more popular than some of the ones that I am reading, it's probably because I've read it. I'll leave a list of some more of the dark academia books that I have read in the description box. If you're curious to know if I've read them, you can check there. So that's why they're not included in this video. I've read a decent number of dark academia, but these were some of the other popular ones that I still hadn't read, which is why I chose them for this video. Before we get into all of the books, I have a couple of quick announcements to make. First of all, as always, my reading journal, the A Clockwork Reader Reading Journal is available. It is linked in the description. It is currently, it should be at least still when this video goes up, on sale on both Amazon and Walmart's website, so if you want to get a good deal on it, I'll be sure to leave those links down below so you can check it out there if you want to keep track of everything that you read. This is a great place to do that. And of course, my bracelet that I designed with Ana Luisa is, as always, linked in the description box below if you would like to get one for yourself. I do also want to thank today's sponsor, which is Simple Retro. I am wearing a couple of pieces from them right now. I will get more into them later in the video and I'll show you some of the dark academia kind of themed pieces that I chose to wear throughout the video. So we'll get into them a bit later, but again, thank you to them for sponsoring this video. So without any further ado, let's get into all five Dark Academia books that I read and all of my thoughts on them. So the first book that I read was If We Were Villains by M. L. Rio. This book is incredibly popular, so I'm sure most of you have either read it or you know what it's about, but if you happen to not know, this book takes place in two different timelines set 10 years apart. So in the present day, we have our main character, Oliver, who has just been released from a 10-year sentence in prison and he begins to tell the detective who arrested him the story of what actually happened 10 years ago. And so then we jump between 10 years ago and present day, and 10 years ago he was attending this arts conservatory where he was studying to become a Shakespearean actor, and something happens to him and his friends while they are there, and obviously he ends up going to prison for it. And so you spend this entire book trying to uncover this mystery set in the tone of a Shakespearean tragedy. Hello everyone, welcome. The book that I started with in this video is If We Were Villains by M. L. Rio. As you can see, I'm very close to the end. I have about like 50 or 60 pages left, so definitely not very much to go. And I 
am loving this. <laughs> I have had this on my shelf for like maybe four years or something. I just picked it up because I had read the synopsis when I first bought it and I saw that it was about these actors who were studying Shakespeare and at the time I was still super into Shakespeare and so it just seemed like the type of thing that I would like. In the past few years it blew up a lot and it's been really popular on TikTok I know and people really love it. So yes, I have been highly anticipating this and I've also been really nervous to see what I'm going to think about it because I'd already set high expectations for myself. However, 60 or so pages from the end, I'm having a great time. I am loving this and I'm very curious to know how it's gonna end. The day that I picked it up, I legitimately just like couldn't put it down. I read through the majority of this within like maybe four, three hours or so and then I haven't had time to just read the very end yet. To me so far, this feels like The Secret History except a lot better. <laughs> I read The Secret History in maybe 2018 or 19 and I remember at the time I really liked it but to be honest with you, I barely remember anything that happens in that book except some random plot twists and the incest. <laughs> I do remember that I enjoyed it at the time, however it really didn't like fully stick with me and that's typically a sign that I didn't absolutely love it and in order to give you like a full review or like a solid opinion on it, I think I would have to reread the book, which I don't plan to do because I don't think I like the book enough and also I've just heard very terrible things about the author, so I'm just not interested. However, of the things that I do remember about The Secret History, I remember that it was extremely pretentious, which obviously the genre lends itself to that, like you are going to get these pretentious academics who think they are better than everyone because um, typically dark academia, if well written, is supposed to be a critique of that culture and those systems. So uh, yes, you're gonna have really pretentious people. However, in my opinion, that book as a whole felt more pretentious. And this one, while still definitely pretentious, is in my opinion, pretentious in the right ways. And it really works. Not my Be Real notification going off right now, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, okay, just had to post that. <laughs> but anyway, back to what I was saying. In my opinion, the secret history is pretentious in the way that dark academia should be pretentious without being overly pretentious. And now the word pretentious is starting to sound fake. <laughs> we are following around this group of essentially theater kids in college in like a very exclusive kind of like conservatory style artsy school. So by nature, you're gonna have a really dramatic, extremely pretentious group of people. This one feels like it's criticizing some of what the characters are doing and their belief systems and everything. And while The Secret History still does that, I feel like this just does a better job of doing that, if that makes sense. But anyway, enough of the comparisons to The Secret History. On its own, this book is fantastic. It is so well written and as a person who was super into Shakespeare, especially when I was in high school and like first couple years of college and stuff, I feel like this is one of those things that feels like it was kind of written for me. Like it's one of those books where I'm like, yes, this is my type of thing. I would never claim to be the most knowledgeable person about Shakespeare, not at all. I've not even read close to all of his plays, but I've read a decent amount. I loved analyzing it. I loved everything about it. And so sometimes the way the characters talk about Shakespeare, um, the fact that they literally talk to each other by quoting Shakespeare back and forth to each other is so incredibly annoying, but it's so good. <laughs> if I met them in real life, I would probably hate them, but I'm also not gonna lie, like some alternate version of me would also be them. <laughs> and that's probably not a good thing to say because there's a lot of lying and deceit and murder in this book. So I, I probably shouldn't compare myself to these people, but I truly, like if I'm being honest, I feel like some other version of me in some parallel universe in some alternate life, if I'd made different decisions, I could be one of these people. I was on the path to be one of these people at some point in my life. I absolutely was. <laughs> and that's what I mean when I say it is my type of pretentious. Shakespeare pretentious, I think, is just like my thing. It's definitely my thing and I eat it up. I live for it, so I'm loving this. <laughs> I'm having such a good time reading it. I am so immersed in this mystery. I really need to know what happens, so I'm gonna go and finish it up and then come back and update you all on my final thoughts because, my god, I am dying to know how this ends. Pun intended. And give me a minute. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> Oh my god, I can't tell if I want to cry. I want to cry. I do want to cry, actually. I'm like gonna cry. <laughs> Just... <laughs> like... <laughs> that was so good. So as I was 
reading maybe like the last 20, 20, 15 pages or so, I, I teared up quite a few times. There were a few lines in there that just really, really hurt. And the buildup and suspense of the last couple scenes and the epilogue, ooh, it was so intense. And at the very, very end, no spoilers for anyone who's read it, obviously, but as you are reading the letter, I was expecting something so different than what we got. I was expecting to feel one emotion and then suddenly it's something else entirely that I was not anticipating. It completely flipped my emotions. And I was expecting to just like sob and suddenly I'm full of hope. Yeah. <laughs> And I want a sequel. I don't actually want a sequel, but I want a sequel. I'm just gonna read a couple of these quotes out of context. They're not gonna make sense, but for anyone who's read it, you just need to know what moments just really, really hit me, really broke me. First up, uh, this one wasn't one of the ones that made me cry, but I just thought it was a really beautiful line. I don't know. It's like, I look at you and suddenly the sonnets make sense. That's, that's such a romantic thing to say to someone. Then we get to the lines that all started breaking me. First, we start off with, I never wanted you to look at me the way you're looking at me right now which was a lot. Then of course we have, but this is how a tragedy like ours or King Lear's breaks your heart by making you believe that the ending might still be happy until the very last minute. I read that and I was like, oh, we still have like 20 pages left. I'm about to suffer. <laughs> then we have the first of the lines where I was just like, okay, I've had enough, but like the tears are starting to flow. I'm not gonna say anyone's names in case you haven't read it so you won't be spoiled for anyone except for Oliver's obviously because he's the main character narrating everything and you know that he's in prison from the very beginning. But two of the characters are talking to him and they're asking him why. And he says, it's like Romeo and Juliet. He doesn't even give an explanation. And then one of them says, what are you talking about? And he just repeats it's like Romeo and Juliet and I lost it in that moment I lost it like because <sighs> it's like Romeo and Juliet like <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I'm fine. And then, of course, we have the classic, I don't understand why. And he says, you know why. Because <laughs> he does. He does know why. I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say other than phenomenal, fantastic, five out of five, 10 out of 10. This was everything I could ever want. I stand by my original belief that this is the secret history, but better. It is also the secret history, but actually gay. Uh, so it's better. <laughs> I would say that this one is more dark academia in terms of vibe and aesthetic and a little bit less heavy on the critique of academia and the systems of oppression in academia. That's definitely something that the book does touch on. It's not like it's not at all present in the story. It absolutely is. Honestly, this is so much more of a love story, a tragic love story, and it definitely chooses to focus more heavily on that. But if you're looking to read Dark Academia that's more of like a critique of the system, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for that purpose. However, I do recommend it because you should read this because this is now one of my favorite books I've ever read. I love it. I knew I was gonna love this. And I will say like for the first 45, 50% of this book, I was really enjoying it, but I didn't think it was gonna become like a favorite favorite. And as I was still getting towards the end, I was still thinking, you know, this might still be like four stars. It's really good, but I don't know if it's gonna be a favorite. But then, you know, those last, 50, 30 pages really just turned it around for me. It gave the book what it was missing for me and it just wrapped everything up exactly in the way that I love and I could not be more happy. I love this group of pretentious, dramatic, Shakespeare loving, thespians. I feel like they are going to stick with me for so long. The way that this book discusses relationships friend groups specifically and how also being in your early 20s in that kind of like an exclusive environment can really like manipulate your emotions and um, especially for them being in such a dramatic environment really heightened uh, everything they were feeling and therefore their actions and reactions to things were much more dramatic than say someone who wasn't in their same environment and I feel like that part of it plus the discussion that the book had of like 
class a little bit and how the different characters came from very different backgrounds and had very different families. Those um, aspects of the story definitely were part of the critique that the book had of academia because it definitely discussed that like exclusivity and how being in that type of an environment really affects you and really kind of puts you on this um, pedestal in your own head. And I really enjoyed that. I thought it was very nuanced and subtle yet at the same time very clear and it was just really well done. There was one thing in this book that, I mean, it makes sense to me. It was just kind of like off-putting to read about. So Oliver has two younger sisters and the youngest one, I believe, or maybe the middle sister has an eating disorder. And he like really brushes it off and like does not care about this girl. And he's like really mean to her. And to be fair, a lot is going on in his life at this time. So like, it makes sense that he doesn't care or doesn't feel any kind of like sympathy for her. The point of that was because Oliver didn't think it was a big deal because um, he was clearly very self-involved, just like a content warning in in general. Definitely look up content warnings for this book if you decide to read it because obviously it deals with murder. It's kind of gory and bloody at times. Anyway, uh, that was just the one thing I would just note. I would say that this found its own little corner in my heart and dug a little hole for itself and just sits there. Except I don't think that it found a place in my heart. I feel like it's always been there. That's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> but something about this just makes me feel like I have always known this story. It has always been with me in some way. And I truly feel like in some parallel world, in some alternate reality where I made one or two different decisions with my life, I would have been in their conservatory and been as annoying and pretentious and dramatic as they are. <laughs> I just feel like there's some version of me living that life right now in some other world. And she's out there and she is so annoying, but she's living her best life, so. I'm happy for her. <laughs> but anyway, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about if we were villains. I really just wanna cry right now. Like, I do not know how to explain the weird sense of melancholy and nostalgia that I'm feeling at the moment. I don't know why I feel so nostalgic, but I really, really do. But I think that's just a testament to how good this is and how well written it is. From beginning to end, this feels like a Shakespeare tragedy and it, is it honestly is the author understands shakespeare on such a deep deep level and that is so evident throughout the entire book and you can tell how skilled of a writer she is as well and i have nothing but praise to give to this book in terms of the writing and the character development and the suspense built for the plot everything again 10 out of 10 a new all-time favorite book. It is gonna be hard for anything else to live up to this, but I do have some hopes for other books in this video. The second book that I read was Catherine House by Elizabeth Thomas. As I was compiling my list of books for this video, I obviously did some research on some dark academia books and tried to find some of the most popular ones that I hadn't read yet. And Catherine House was one that I saw pretty frequently on a lot of dark academia recommendation lists, yet I don't think it's an extremely popular book and based on the reviews, it's a little bit mixed. So I was curious to see what I was going to think about it. All right, so I just finished reading Catherine House. I'll just start off by saying that I understand the mixed reviews with this one. I don't even really know how to tell you what I think of it other than I just know I didn't like it. It's a very strange book and it's very atmospheric. It relies heavily on the inner monologue of our main character as well as like a bit of a mystery and it's just very character centric and atmospheric, which is typically exactly my type of book. But for some reason, it just did not work with this one for me. This book took me a solid two to three weeks to finish reading and I usually read a book in like one to two days so that's a long time for me and I would not have finished it if I wasn't filming this video. I genuinely wanted to DNF it like maybe a hundred pages in. I was so bored and I stayed bored until the end. The very end did help a bit. It picked up and I was more invested than I was in the beginning and the middle but I still did not care very much and I honestly just don't know how to place it, what the reason is but I just didn't click with this. I didn't vibe with it. I don't think it's bad book but I don't like it. So I feel like I'm in a very strange position right now trying to talk about it because I don't feel like I can give you any kind of like constructive review of this. So Catherine House is essentially about this very prestigious school called Catherine House. It's a very very exclusive university that basically cuts its students off from the outside world so everyone who is there doesn't really have access to the outside world the entire time they're there and essentially this university is a cult. Not even essentially, it is a cult. Like it just flat out is a cult. And as you can expect 
suspect some shady things happen. And our main character starts to become suspicious of the school and what's going on there. So she tries to uncover the mystery of Catherine House and um, try and find out what the university is doing to its students. And yeah, based on that description, again, I feel like it's the type of thing I should have liked because it is very atmospheric, it's mysterious, it's dark and gothic, but something about this just did not click with me and I really wish it had. This one out of the two books I've read in this video so far has been the one I think to discuss academia the most. So in terms of it being like dark academia, I would definitely classify it as a dark academia book. Academia is clearly a very prominent theme in the story and so much of the novel is just a metaphor for how these academic institutions like universities invite you in to their inner circle, this exclusive prestigious space that promises you greatness, success, wealth, status, all of these things and gives you access to all of this incredible information and knowledge but so much of that is dependent upon the exploitation of others and especially oftentimes exploitation of those students themselves and the cult-like nature of Catherine I feel like was very obviously a metaphor for that and I really enjoyed that part of the book. The mystery was one of the only things that kept me reading because I was just curious to know what exactly it was that the university was doing so that's the only reason I kept going but yeah I I don't know like I just I feel so strange about this because it feels like the type of thing I should love but I just didn't. Again, overall, in terms of like a dark academia novel, it's dark and disturbing, it's a little bit gruesome, it's absolutely a critique of academic institutions and the university system in general and the influence that that type of an environment can have on your psyche as a student who is let into one of these exclusive circles. So yeah, it, it takes those boxes, but for my personal enjoyment, it was like a two out of five. So I gave this two out of five stars. Um, again, it is the type of thing I think some people could like. I just personally didn't love it and I can't give it a higher rating than that because I didn't like it. I liked the themes, I liked the subjects it was discussing, I just did not care about the manner in which uh, we got there because I was bored. I'm sorry, I wish I liked it more, but I really didn't. I think if you like dark academia and you like atmospheric books that are mostly no plot, just vibes, there is a chance you could like this. But again, as someone who loves those things as well, I personally didn't love it. So yeah, I wouldn't dissuade anyone from reading this necessarily, but yeah, unfortunately just wasn't my thing. And hopefully I like the next book more. I'm really gonna be disappointed if I don't love these next books. <laughs> All right, so a quick interlude from all the dark academia books to talk a little bit about some dark academia fashion and let you know about today's sponsor, which is Simple Retro. Simple Retro is a fashion brand that focuses on vintage and retro style pieces, and they are kindly sponsoring today's video and provided me with a few pieces to wear throughout this video. And I'm just gonna do a little haul for you of some of the clothes that I got from them. First off, starting off with the sweater that I am currently wearing, which is probably my favorite piece. This is this beautiful brown knit sweater with this like textured little design on it that I absolutely love. They kind of look like flowers. It definitely looks very vintage and it's also very much kind of in line with the dark academia aesthetic. I tried to pick some pieces that I felt like would fit the aesthetic of this video and also things I would love to wear. Next I got this gorgeous cable knit cardigan. It has these really beautiful buttons on it with kind of like this gold cross stitch design and cardigans are definitely an essential in my closet. The next piece is another definite classic and that is this white button up with this really cute Peter Pan collar. It has this rose embroidery all over it too and these sleeves with the little lace detail at the ends as well as these adorable little rose buttons. So it's very like floral themed so I think it just has a very very cute look and I love layering this with the last piece that I got from Simple Retro which is this this espresso colored sweater vest. I think it looks so cute together. Absolutely a dark academia look. And these two, I think, just go perfectly together. So yeah, those were all the pieces that I got from Simple Retro. I've been wearing them all constantly throughout the fall. If you want to check out the rest of their fall and pre-fall collection, I'll have the links down below, as well as the links to all of the specific pieces that I got, if you want to check them out as well. Everything is linked in the description box. But again, thank you so much to Simple Retro for sponsoring this video and for helping me complete the dark academia vibe of this video. But now let's get into 
into the next book that I read. The next Dark Academia book that I read was These Violent Delights by Micah Nemer Ever. This is a book that I'd heard almost nothing about before reading it. I pretty much took this on my cousin's recommendation because she'd read it and told me that she liked it and she really likes Dark Academia. And I saw it on a few Dark Academia recommendation lists as well, but I really didn't know anything about this book. So this was gonna be a complete surprise for me. And I was going in with essentially no expectations. Okay, so I just finished These Violent Delights and what a strange book. I don't know what I was expecting, but I was not expecting be gay, do crime. <laughs> but at this point I should have been expecting it because let's be honest, the majority of Dark Academia seems to be be gay, do crime. Like they're all gay and they're all committing murder. Don't know why, uh, but again, not complaining, it's fun. <laughs> Even more so than the other books that I've read in this video and other Dark Academia books I've read in the past, like The Secret History, this book is the epitome of be gay, do crime. This is just about these two boys in the 70s in college together who fall in love and then we're just committing crimes. That's the whole book. And even with that knowledge of dark academia and how this is like a very common theme in the genre, this book was still like on a different level of that. Like this was really about the murder and the crime. It was honestly more of like a thriller, mystery kind of suspense novel more than dark academia, I would say. I definitely see why people would categorize it as dark academia, but personally I feel like it fits a bit more into like the thriller or suspense kind of genre because again it's far more heavily focused on the like interpersonal turmoil of these characters and the uh, murder that was happening. <laughs> if you like really delving into the mind of a character, trying to pick apart their brain and knowing every single weird, disgusting thought that kind of crosses their mind no matter how disturbing, and you also really like morally gray characters, I don't think it gets much more morally gray than the two of them. This book follows the story of our main character, Paul, who is a freshman in college, and he meets another freshman named Julian, and the two of them click instantly. And the story is also set in the 1970s, so obviously being openly gay in the 1970s is not really an option for these two 17-year-olds who come from one, a religious background where Paul's family is Jewish and in Julian's family, a very like conservative, uh, privileged, wealthy background. So, you know, they can't really be in an open relationship. So they're both very repressed in uh, a number of ways. And for Paul, this repression kind of leads to these violent outbursts that he has. And so this kind of leads the two of them to be in this very, very intense, very passionate, obsessive, violent and codependent relationship. It is so toxic, like so toxic. You wanna talk about toxic relationships? This might top it all, except for the fact that the book acknowledges that this relationship is toxic. So that's what sets it apart from other toxic relationships that you might have watched or read in other things. By the end, you could cry um, because it's emotional, but also you don't even know who you're rooting for because what they were feeling and thinking a lot of the time while based in noble beliefs and ideologies, the way they went about seeking justice was at times questionable. And the way that they were just so unbelievably infatuated with one another and obsessed with one another was both extremely disturbing to watch and completely mesmerizing. So the book becomes this amalgamation of obsessive, toxic, codependent love and passion that is then externalized through murder. It's very much the epitome of are they gonna kiss each other or kill each other? So if that's your thing, I think you'll really love this. But just know it's very violent at times. Um, so definitely look up some content warnings. And also homophobia is very prevalent in this story. Again, it's the 70s. These two kids are very repressed. Their families are not the most accepting. So, you know, that's gonna be a theme in the story as well. So just be aware of that before you decide to read it. But my God, like my eyes were glued, or my ears, I was listening to the audiobook, my ears were glued to my headphones. Like I just had to keep listening because I had to know what was gonna happen next. I was very invested in the story. <laughs> when I read a dark academia book, I feel like the school setting and the atmosphere that I get from the school setting is a very significant part of what makes the book dark academia. The academic setting is almost its own character. That's how heavily present it is in the story. Whereas in 
this book, I feel like it didn't have that. The academic setting was obviously still like relevant to the story and it wouldn't be the same without it, but it wasn't as conspicuous as it has been in some of the other books that I've read. And to me, that's such an important part of a dark academia book. The setting just has to be its own character in the story and this one didn't have that which is again why i think it, it aligns a lot better with something more like a thriller or a suspense mystery kind of novel that doesn't necessarily make me dislike the book or anything it's just it kind of recategorizes it for me that's where i was like thrown off a little bit because i was expecting some more of that but we got a lot more of um the being gay and doing crime so you know, it's a fine trade-off. I have no problem with that. I just was expecting something a little different, which is okay. <laughs> it's the type of thing where I feel like I have to go back and reread it in order to fully, fully grasp every single detail because this was extremely intricate. The writing was really beautiful and it was also extremely detailed. So if you weren't paying attention to something, you would miss something later on because everything was connected to each other. And the very last line of the book is just genius in my opinion. And it was, it was the type of thing that gives you like goosebumps. And I feel like I would want to go back and reread everything just so I can connect everything perfectly. I really did enjoy it. I gave this book, I think, a 3.5 out of 5 stars. It's almost 4 stars. It's not my favorite thing. I would definitely recommend it if this is your type of thing. I don't think it's bad by any means. But again, in terms of dark academia, if you're looking for something that has that very intense academic vibe, uh, this one doesn't have that so much. But if you're looking for that morally gray, inner turmoil, will they, won't they, kiss me or kill me vibe, then I definitely think you would enjoy this and I would absolutely recommend it. Uh, it was a very interesting book, unlike anything I've ever read, but I am very glad that I read it. All right, so the next book I read was The One and Only Babel by R.F. Kuang. This was probably the book that I was the most excited to read in this video because I'd been anticipating it ever since it was announced. I'm sure you've heard so much about it at this point. Um, it just came out a few months ago and everyone has been talking about it. Everyone's been giving it so much praise. And so I was incredibly, incredibly excited to read this book. All right, hello everyone. So I'm currently in the middle of Babel and I have so much to say. <laughs> First of all, if you're wondering which edition I have, this is the Fox and Wit edition, I believe. They did like a special dust jacket. The book underneath is exactly the same as the US hardcover. I had never heard of them before, but I saw a photo of this cover and I immediately ordered it. I hadn't read the book. The book wasn't even out yet. I pre-ordered this just because I liked this cover so much. Anyway, the cover aside, this book is fantastic. I am not surprised. I had very high expectations for this. Very, very high expectations. I've had this feeling that this is probably going to be one of my favorite books of the year, potentially a new favorite book of all time, and so far I was not wrong. <laughs> I feel like books very seldom live up to the hype that is built around them, especially when it's to this scale, but this one definitely does. I'm I'm loving it. I genuinely feel like I need to sit down and write a paper on everything that I am just absolutely amazed by in this book because there's so much. There's so much here to dissect. I'm currently about to start book four, so I have like this much left. Essentially, this story takes place in the 1800s in England at Oxford, and we follow around this group of students who attend the university as translators for Babel, which is like their translation department. It's the most prestigious department, and the majority of these students in the translation department are foreign-born students. Most of them were born in different countries and then brought here when they were young, given an English upbringing, and then sent to the university to study as translators. Leaders. That's not every student at Babel, but it's a solid number of them. And our main character, Robin, is one of these students, and he was born in what was known as Canton at the time in China, and he was brought over to England very young by this professor who becomes his guardian. And then years go by and he starts attending Babel and he meets a few of his um, classmates, his cohort, Remy, Victoire, and Letty. Remy is from Calcutta, and Letty and Victoire are two of the only women who attend the university. But in this world, there is a very like light magic system. There's just one kind of magical element in this world, and that is through silver working. Typically in this world, at least mostly what they've talked about so far is that they use silver for healing, but you can do a variety of things with it. It's not just meant for that. So yeah, it's based on like 
silver, which I also find really fascinating because obviously if you know anything about this period in history, silver was a very significant commodity because it was very big in trade at the time. So her use of silver works perfectly in the story. It makes the historical aspect of this even more uh, believable set in this fantasy world. So it really does almost feel like you're actually reading history, but there's just this little tweak. Obviously there's some things that are still changed up, but for the most part, she's really sticking to what actually historically happened during this period of time. And then of course, the main component, the main theme of this story is colonialism, imperialism, and the British Empire and their impact on the entire world. We have these young people kind of like realizing that for the first time, realizing just how pervasive the British Empire has been globally, how they have had their hand in everything, everywhere, and the way that that pits different countries against one another, but it can all always lead back to the empire. And a lot of it is about the characters like guilt, trying to grapple with that given the privileges that they've been afforded, how uh, Robin always feels like super guilty because he knows that he's benefited a lot from what the British Empire is doing and he doesn't want to give all of that up. But at the same time, he knows that what they're doing is so evil that he can't ignore it. Before I started reading it, I was kind of expecting something that was going to feel very academic in terms of of the text itself. Like I felt like it was going to be a bit more dense and a bit more like an academic read. Um, but it is not actually. It is very, very easy to read. I feel like this is extremely accessible for anybody who wants to read a fantasy novel, anyone who wants to like learn a little bit about British imperialism. Oh, another thing that I have absolutely loved in this book, the depiction of Letty as this white woman who is obviously facing a lot of obstacles being one of the only women to be studying at Oxford. She definitely faces a lot of sexism, but she uses her whiteness as a shield and a defense constantly, especially against Victoire. When Victoire faces uh, both sexism and racism because of that intersectionality in her identity, Letty doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that Victoire is black and how that also contributes to the way that she's discriminated against in a way that is different from Letty. And I feel like this book just does such a good job of having that nuanced discussion because you do not find that in everything and it's done so brilliantly. I was not expecting that in here. I don't know why. Oh, I didn't know what characters were in the book, so I guess that's why. But I was not expecting it. And the second that Letty started opening her mouth, I was like, oh, I see how this is gonna go. And I'm loving where we're going with this. Like, it's just done so well. That's both such a common experience that a lot of women of color understand on a very personal level and also historically extremely accurate. Because during this time, the abolition movement was extremely big and what was right on the heels of the abolition movement, the women's rights movement. And a lot of the early women's rights movement um, language and writing and the laws that were eventually put into place were heavily based on the language of the abolition movement. And that's often a piece of history that is overlooked or forgotten or just blatantly ignored. But historically, white women have used people of color, especially black people, to then push forward the women's rights movement. And there was a lot of racism within those groups and within those early movements because white women believed that they deserved those rights over people of color oftentimes. And I think that depicting Letty the way that she does in this book is absolutely a nod to that. And I completely respect her for it because it is not something that a lot of people talk about, but you won't find that a lot in fiction. And to have that in such a popular fantasy book, just brilliant. Uh, props to her. I love it. Chef's Kiss. Amazing. This book is amazing. Um, yeah, anyway, I am very excited to continue reading and get to the end. I will hopefully finish it today and get back to you all with my final thoughts, which I'm sure will be very similar to what I'm feeling right now. There's no way <laughs> that I think that this will end up becoming anything less than at least four stars. Right now it's going to be a five. Um, I think it will maintain that status. I don't have a review for this book. I I don't have I don't have anything to say. I just I just wanna cry. I wasn't expecting this like grief to hit me. <laughs> oh my god. I haven't cried like this in a while. 
just just laugh it off but i can't you know <laughs> that was so heartbreaking it's so good honestly i'm crying because it's so good it unearthed some deep deep rooted emotions and feelings that I have not been able to express for a really long time and it put it into words in a way that I just I expected this book to be amazing okay but I did not expect to relate to it in a way that I didn't know I needed to relate to something like oh my god I'm so sad now <laughs> It's good. It's it's good. This is good. It's so good. Just read it, you know, like <laughs> Oh my god I just can't stop crying like just... This is just another side effect of colonialism and capitalism, you know, it makes me cry Okay, I need to I need to collect myself. I need to collect myself. These tears are not gonna go away and um, I I can't do anything about it. And now my camera is running out of space because nothing can go right right now because I'm just, I'm too overwhelmed. <laughs> I don't think that I can give any kind of logical review of this right now. You're just gonna get emotional, Hannah, okay? You're gonna get all of the emotions that I'm feeling because I cannot articulate a single thing that I'm feeling at the moment other than overwhelming emotion, uh, grief, and a sense of being understood in the best and worst way. <laughs> I think you just need to read it. This book speaks for itself. Nothing is unclear and I fully mean this as a compliment. There's no digging you need to do to like get underneath something to like figure out what they're saying. Like it is just there. It is laid out for you so clearly. In terms of dark academia, this is the truest, truest and purest form of dark academia. Nothing is more true to the actual like core of what this genre is meant to represent. It's unbelievable. It's perfect. It's brilliant. It's every adjective. Insert every single positive adjective you can possibly think of. It's that. It's everything. It is one of the best things, if not the best thing I've read. I keep saying that about things that I've read this year because I've read some really, really great books, but oh my god. Uh, they, oh my god. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to talk about this without any spoilers, so I'm gonna put an icon on the screen, and once this is gone, I have stopped talking about the spoilers, so if you don't want to be spoiled, you can come back and watch from that point on, I'll also leave a timestamp in the description box so that you can skip over any spoilers. But I just, I need to talk about this one very important part that I kind of touched on earlier and we have to revisit it because I knew it, I knew it, and I will always trust my gut. <laughs> and of course, I'm talking about none other than Letty. Letty, oh my god, the depiction of Letty's character in this book I think is probably one of the best things about the book. I'm sure that there's fiction out there. I have not read everything, obviously. That's not possible. But of everything I have read, I have never read any fiction where I have seen a better depiction of the self-victimization of white women. It's unbelievable. Like, she went there. She went there and she said what needed to be said. And it was just, oh my god. I could feel it from Letty. And I was like, you're just being judgmental, Hannah. You're being judgmental. You don't know. You don't know that she wouldn't agree with them or that she wouldn't help them. But I had this gut feeling, the way Robin had this gut feeling, the way Remy had this gut feeling, don't, I can't even talk about Remy, I'm gonna fucking cry. And the way that Victoire had this gut feeling, they all knew and I knew it. I could feel it, but I didn't want to believe it. And then of course it happens. Of course it happens. Of course she kills Remy. And of course we know why it was Remy that she chose to kill. And Robin says it plain as day because a brown man rejected her and she could not bear the shame of that. I have been so sad this whole time and from the time that Remy died, I have been expecting him to come back. I was like, he's he's gotta come back, there's no way. I was in such denial. And then I finally get to the very last page, of course he's actually dead. I still haven't fully accepted this the way Robin like never fully processed it. I don't think I'm ever gonna fully process it. It's that feeling where, you know when someone will like talk around a subject and they'll never like fully honestly say the truth and you know what the truth is because either you were there, you witnessed it, you experienced it, whatever. Like, you know what the fact of this matter is, but they won't say that thing. Like, they'll just say things adjacent to it, but will never fully admit that, like, actual truth. That's what this book felt like. It felt like admitting the truth. I don't have a better way to describe it. I feel simultaneously so much smarter after reading this book, but also really dumb because I can't articulate a single thought that I'm having. I can't form sentences. I can barely form words right now. This is one of just the most 
honest books I have ever read. There's this moment that I marked down because it was, it, it I feel like epitomizes what I'm trying to describe. And this is right when they tell Letty about what the Empire is trying to do and what Babel is trying to do um, with the opium in Canton and like the war that will inevitably start. And at first she doesn't believe them and she doesn't want to accept what's going on. And then she starts crying and she's sobbing and they say, Rami and Robin watched unsure what to make of this. On someone else it would have been performative, sickening even. But with Letty, they knew it was not a charade. Letty could not cry on command. She could not even fake basic emotions on command. She was too stiff, too transparent. They knew she was unable to act in any other way than how she felt. So it felt cathartic seeing her break down like this, knowing that at last she understood how they all felt. It was a relief to see that in her they still had an ally. Usually a book will stop there, but RF Kuang doesn't do that because she said, we're gonna, we're gonna paint the whole picture. We're not gonna leave anything out. And the next passage says, Still, something did not seem right, and Robin could tell from Victoire and Rami's faces that they thought so too. It took him a moment to realize what it was that grated on him, and when he did, it would bother him constantly, now and thereafter. It would seem a great paradox, the fact that after everything they had told Letty, all the pain they had shared, she was the one who needed comfort. I just, where do I send my love letter to RF Kuang? Because, holy shit, this is how you write about intersections of privilege and power and identity and do it well. The differences in the way that Victoire, Remy, Robin, and Letty experience their lives at Oxford as students and as people is written so intricately with so much nuance and so much clarity that you can fully understand the minds of each of these characters and why they believe the things they believe and why they make the choices that they make. Letty has fully convinced herself that her betrayal of her friends and her murdering Remy was justifiable because her belief system reinforces that and the society and culture and empire that she lives under reinforces that every day. So there was never going to be a time where she was actually going to join them and actually going to support them and fight for them because she would never benefit from that because she had everything to lose and nothing to gain. That feeling of betrayal from somebody who you hope will be on your side is such a prolific feeling that people of color experience on a daily basis. It may not be to this scale, but you feel it in the everyday interactions that you will have with a person. And RF Kuang does such a beautiful job of depicting that in this book. It's unbelievable. It was so realistic. And I think it is part of the reason why this book made me feel so emotional because I could understand so many of the things these characters thought felt and experienced. Anyone who has recommendations of more fantasy books and more books in general that are told from like an anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist perspective, please give them to me. I need to read them. This has such mass appeal. Most people are not going to sit there and read anti-colonialist theory in their free time. It's just not like fun, you know, for the majority of people, but a lot of people will read this. A lot of people will read a fantasy book published by a New York Times bestselling author who's written another very popular fantasy series. They will read this and you will get the same messaging out of this that you will get reading those articles and those journals. But stuff like that is far more academic. It's far more inaccessible to a lot of people. I'm not saying that those things are not valuable. They absolutely are. And if you want to learn more about these things, absolutely. I think it's something you should study, read nonfiction about these things. But in terms of just like the general media we get out to people, this is how you do that. You're not gonna do that through like academic readings. You're gonna do that through this because this is something that far more people have access to. This is the type of book that I think regardless of who you are, it will force you to reevaluate some things. It's gonna force you to look at things a little bit differently from a perspective that you might not have had before. Even if you are somebody who is fairly well read in imperialism and colonialism, even if you know a fair bit about that, you have so much to gain from reading this book. If nothing else, just witnessing the emotion emotions and experiences of these characters and that alone I feel like is just a story that needs to be told and it I oh I just I'm sorry like I really just can't talk about this properly <laughs> there's a line in here that I think it's probably the first thing that I even marked that just really messed with me but he says it just doesn't feel it doesn't feel like I have the right to be alive and I'm trying so hard not to cry. <laughs> that feeling, the not feeling like you have a right to be alive, it sounds so morbid and so sad, but it is so true. I have felt that so often in my life. And like, I, 
oh my god <laughs> he's later talking to a different character about the same thing saying that he felt like he didn't have a right and then he continues on to say and what did i do i lived a life i shouldn't have i had what millions of people didn't all that suffering and the whole time i was drinking champagne siri play champagne problems by taylor swift please it broke me that line broke me so much so much of this book just utterly broke me i feel like i simultaneously had a history lesson and a therapy session the guilt that robin feels being a student at this institution knowing what the institution is actually doing and how it's exploiting these people his people and other people and not knowing what to do with this guilt. It was a feeling that I don't think I've known how to express for a long time. And RF Kuang did that for me and now I don't need to, so thanks. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, I really feel like I had a therapy session with this one. This was cathartic on so many levels. <laughs> Probably my favorite book I've read this year. I'm gonna go sit and cry a little bit more over my feelings about Babel. Um, really wasn't expecting those tears. I. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Actually, I know exactly where that came from, but I don't want to go into that. <laughs> Five stars, a million stars, infinite stars, <laughs> infinite stars, okay? If you only read one more book this year, make it this one. Read this book, do yourself a favor. It's essential. It is required reading. On a Clockwork Reader's YouTube channel, this book is now required reading. I'm gonna make a required reading list for you all, you know? That's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna make a video where I make my list of required reading books. If you wanna know who I am, if you wanna know what this channel and me and our community and everything stands for, we're gonna have a required reading list um, and it's a prerequisite to like join the club. But yeah, this is now an A Clockwork Reader required read. So get on it, read this if you haven't yet, um, you'll thank me later. And finally, the very last book I read was Ace of Spades by Farida Abike Imide. Ace of Spades is a book that I've heard a decent amount about online. I didn't really know what the plot was about, but I just knew that a lot of people really liked it. And it's gotten a lot of praise ever since it was released. It's a dual perspective story that follows around these two students at this very prestigious school. And they are the only two black students at this predominantly white high school. And the story is quite literally a combination of Gossip Girl and Get Out. The book actually opens with an epigraph that quotes Gossip Girl and Get Out. So I'm not just saying that, like it, that was intentional. <laughs> and so it's a mystery as these two students try and figure out who is targeting them and why. Okay, so I finished reading Ace of Spades and first thing I will say, that epigraph tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> the book first opens with a quote from Gossip Girl. They say life is full of surprises, that our dreams really can come true. Then again, so can our nightmares. And then immediately followed up with a quote from Get Out. All I know is sometimes if there's too many white folks, I get nervous. And I have never in my life seen a more relevant epigraph because everything that follows is exactly what that just told you. This book is exactly Gossip Girl mixed with Get Out with a little bit of Pretty Little Liars sprinkled into there. That's it. Like, I wouldn't need to tell you anything else. That's the whole book. It's a good vibe. <laughs> there were some scenes and moments that I feel like were almost verbatim from something that happened in Gossip Girl or something that happened in Get Out. And it really just felt like watching a CW drama, except this time the characters are actually people of color and they're not all white for once. <laughs> I feel like if I had read this when I was in high school, I would have absolutely loved it. I have some like mixed feelings about this and not about the book itself exactly but a kind of about my experience of reading the book only because I think that this book reads a little bit too young for me personally just based on like my taste now and like what I like to read. It felt a little bit younger to me which makes sense because it's a YA novel so I'm not knocking the book itself for that. Kind of like early Gossip Girl and early Pretty Little Liars where it feels a little bit more youthful which again is not a problem. It's just not what I personally prefer to read anymore because story-wise I think it's great. It's well put together. It was entertaining and I think it has a really important message just for me personally, I didn't find it really suspenseful or even that mysterious. Like a lot of the things were easy for me to guess. And I think that's just because I have watched Get Out, watched Pretty Little Liars and watched Gossip Girl all multiple times. So if you put all those three things together, you can kind of predict what's gonna happen in this. You know, if you know Gossip Girl and you know Get Out, you know where the story is going. So yeah, for that reason, it was a bit predictable for me. It was still a good story. And I just think that this book is an important book and an important YA book to have because Get Out is obviously for adults. And while Gossip Girl is definitely targeted towards a younger audience, um, it's lacking a lot of the nuance, the representation that people want in their trashy, fun, 
rich kids school stories and Ace of Spades offers you all of that. I think also of all the books I read in this video this was definitely one of the ones that would sit higher on the list in terms of a dark academia book that actually criticized the system and criticized the exploitation and racism that exists within academia which as I've said at the very beginning is something I deeply appreciate in dark academia. I think it's an essential part of the genre and this one definitely had plenty of that. The main female character Chiamaka is kind of like a Blair Waldorf type. She's like the it girl at the school and then the main male character Devon is kind of like Dan Humphrey if Dan Humphrey wasn't you know a creepy stalker and the worst. Like Dan if he was the good kid. He's the scholarship kid and so he kind of has like a different place in this school and he feels very much outcast not just because he's black but also because he's a scholarship kid. The story is also queer and both of the main characters are queer. So yeah you really get great representation wrapped up with a bit of nostalgia for anybody who really loved Gossip Girl and Pretty Little Liars and Get Out as well. I think we deserve more dark academia both in YA and adult with people of color as the main cast of characters because if we're really going to be critiquing academia as an institution we do need to put the people who are affected most by it at the forefront and that is oftentimes um, students of color. I think it's great to have that perspective and it's great to have it in a YA book too. So yeah for this one I think I would give it about three to three and a half out of five stars. It's not my personal favorite but I see the merit in it and I think that if you like YA mystery novels and you like dark academia and you want the perfect blend of Gossip Girl and Get Out you just have to read it. But there you all have it. That is it for all of the dark academia books that I read for this video. I had a great time making this video. This is probably one of my favorite experiment videos I've done just because this is one of my favorite genres but it was also one of my favorite videos because I now have have two new all-time favorite books and I love when that happens. All around I'd call this video a success as far as my experiments go. This was definitely one of the better ones. <laughs> For me that is. You might not have laughed as much because I wasn't suffering the entire time hating what I was reading, um, but for me, it was it was a good time. <laughs> Let me know in the comments down below if you have read any of the books that I mentioned in this video. What are your thoughts on them? What are your thoughts on dark academia as a genre in general? And the aesthetic as well. Do you like it? Do you dislike it? What are your criticisms of the aesthetic? I would love to hear all of your thoughts and I would also love to hear some more of your dark academia book recommendations. Probably something more in line with Babel or If We Were Villains as those are the two that I definitely loved the most in this video. But I will gladly take all of your recommendations. Again, a huge thank you to Simple Retro for for sponsoring this video and for providing me with the clothes to make this video truly complete. If you would like to follow me on any of my social media to keep up with what I'm reading and everything else that I'm doing, because despite the fact that I have been a bit absent, I have been doing a lot of things and things that I can tell you about eventually. I will hopefully be a little bit more present. It's just been a busy couple of months, so I'm sorry for the delay in videos. Um, it was unplanned, but it was necessary, so I hope this one was at least fun for you to watch. But yes, as always, my links are in the description box below, so please go ahead follow me on there so we can talk about all the dark academia books and all of the other books because I have many more things I plan to read before the end of this year. Very excited for them all. But again, thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. Bye!